pleasure, privilege to introduce the Honorable Governor of the State of Kerala, Mr. Arif Mohammad Khan. A few words about him. Mr. Arif Mohammad Khan is serving as the 22nd Distinguished Governor of Kerala. He has been a seasoned politician and has studied the law. He's a man who speaks his mind. I would call him a reformist and a man with a with a, with a vision for the country. He's a visionary. Mr. Khan has walked out of the Rajiv Gandhi cabinet in 1986, protesting the then Prime Minister's stand in the Shah Mano case, which had paved the way for reform in Muslim personal law. He uninhibitedly defended the Supreme Court's judgment on the Shah Mano case in Parliament as well. And, and so when he speaks, he speaks from, from conviction, which he has stood for in the past as uh, uh, in the past very times as well and he's not put political office before his own conviction rhythm would absolutely. you like to add to that absolutely as we welcome mr arif mohammed khan on the show sir we also remember he's donned numerous hats professionally but what has shined through every time is that he is a reformist mr arif mohammed khan for many years when India and people were silent on the issue of triple talaq, spoke up about it and said it should be punishable with three years in jail. He also welcomed the Karnataka High Court's judgment that upheld hijab is not an essential garment. Absolutely. And, and Rhythm, he is on record saying, and I'm quoting Mr. Khan now, he said, it is obligatory on part of the state to take steps to create an environment conducive to the enactment of a uniform civil code as early as possible. These are his words. So today I am sure that his lecture is awaited with bated breath. So without any further ado, let us all welcome and I welcome warmly uh, the Honorable Governor of Kerala, Mr. Arif Mohammed Khan. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Adabji, and your colleague and my gratitude to Maheshji for the invitation. First, I would like to pay my tributes to late Shri Ram Jethwalani Ji, who was, as rightly pointed out by Tusharji, not only a great legal mind, highly erudite, uh, and his whether arguments in the courts or uh, speeches in parliament, they were marked by wit and humor. Uh, and I am personally beneficiary, recipient of his love and affection. So I remember him fondly. And I uh, would like to compliment Maheshji for organizing this lecture uh, in his name on a subject, I'm sure he must have been greatly interested in. Before I come to the uh, topic, I would like to make reference to a noting on an official file by George Hamilton who was Secretary of State for India soon after the British Crown had taken over the administration from East India Company after 1857. Now, while sitting in London, he's writing on this file which has gone from India. He says, one hardly knows what to wish for India unity of ideas and actions would be very dangerous politically. These are very ringing words. He says, if we do anything which creates unity of ideas and actions among Indians, that would be very dangerous politically. Divergence of ideas and collision are administratively troublesome. Of the latter, of the two, the latter is least risky, though it throws anxiety and responsibility upon the officers on the spot where friction exists. 
So all the, whether they were constitutional measures, the policies, executive action, everything was decided in the light of this noting of the topmost officer, of the uh, topmost British officer, as far as India is concerned. So our problem is not really uniform civil code. Our problem is the colonial hangover we have not been able to get rid of. We still use, not just in the mat on the matter of uniform civil code, even otherwise, we continue to use the same language and idiom which we have inherited from the colonial powers. Do not forget that British India, the building block of India was community. The Britishers never recognized us as a nation. They said we are a conglomeration of communities, social groups. No one can have the right to speak on behalf of all Indians. In 1947, we, we became free. In 1949, we adopted our new constitution. According to the new constitution, it is not the communities which are the building block. It is the individual citizen who is the building block of Indian nation, of India as a state. Even if you look at Article 25, which is invoked frequently when demands are made in the name of religion to allow uh, things which essentially are of separatist nature. Read the article carefully. The article does not give this right to the community. This is an individual's right. Because, and I will give you an example. Say, for instance, in the Shabano case, when government decided to overturn the judgment of the Supreme Court, the Muslims of India, majority might have been of one opinion, but they all were not of one opinion. Now, when government accepted the interpretation of one group, then what practically it means? Practically, it means that you have those who did not differ with the interpretation of the Muslim per personal law board. You denied them the right to religion. Why? Because one group's opinion you imposed on everybody. Just now, Mahiji said that 1986, Shabano case, the remarks of Chief Justice Chandrachur, they failed to evoke any response from the politicians. And Anabji, you also repeated the same thing. That is not right. It evoked response, but in the reverse direction. We, India at the time of independence or at the time of the making of the constitution had accepted that personal laws, family laws, we will accept the relig uh, that they, uh, religious laws. We had accepted that. But in 1986, after the remarks of Justice Chandrachur, when we tried to deny protection of section, uh, uh, section, I think it is 4, 425 or something. No, 145. 145. When we, when we decided to deny protection to Muslim women, under, our, under section 125 of CRPC, then we started marching in the opposite direction. We erased the obligation, the constitutional obligation of the government was to create conducive atmosphere in the country so that uniform civil court can become possible. When the constitutional father, when they had when they had inserted Article 44 in the Constitution, 
that was that represented advancement of thought and the framers fondly hope that with the advancement of education and the strengthening of national spirit it would soon become a reality but as i said instead in fact if you if you look at the proceedings of the constituent assembly the framers of the constitution were deeply aware that india had to suffer long spell of foreign domination or slavery because our society was divided from within so they took two major steps and the pro and the proceedings of the constituent assembly will make it clear to you that actually they contemplated three major steps but they took two major steps one was abolition of untouchability and the other was abolition of separate electorate because through the instrumentality of caste which rested on untouchability this society was deeply divided from within and because of the separate electorate which which was introduced by the britishers and that you should consider in the light of the of the noting of george hamilton why separate electorate was introduced the separate electorate if caste divided people on the social lines separate electorate divided people on the religious lines and the constituent assembly took these two major decisions to abolish both untouchability and the separate electorate and regarding the third they inserted a provision in the directive principles of policy because you can it becomes Uh, the fidelity to the ideal we should be very faithful to the ideals at the same time one has to be sensitive to the actual and they were aware that we have not only that we have attained freedom after long period of time but our country has been partitioned and our country country partition was demanded on the basis that in united india the religion of one community will be in danger the culture will be in danger everything which they have they, that will be in danger and that is the reason that you can uh, i would like to refer to an interview which was given by pandit jawaharlal nehru to taya zinkin taya zinkin was wife of an indian uh, of an ics officer who was british who had stayed in india after india became free but at the time when he was retiring taya zinkin who used to work for guardian she interviewed pandit jawaharlal nehru and during the course of this long interview taya zinkin asked pandit ji who was a leading light of the freedom movement as well she asked him what your you consider your life's greatest achievement and pandit ji unhesitatingly said i was able to secure rights for my hindu sisters which were denied to them for centuries and what was your major disappointment so far and pandit ji again said he said the thing which i did for my hindu sisters i could not do for my muslim sisters so we must after all now now the freedom is 75 years old the uniform civil code is not to create uniformity in this country this country has always cherished diversity this country right from the beginning of its civilizational journey it has made the proclamation ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti this country has said bharat eshu istriya purcho nana varna prakritite nana de varchane yukta nana karmani kurvate the people of india they have different racial stock they their customs and their rituals are different they their modes of worship are different we have always cherished diversity we have always believed that all people should not be confined to one single interpretation of reality 
everyone, the truth is one, the reality is one, the supreme spirit is one, but it is described variously. And that is what Swami Vivekananda had also referred to in his speech uh, in the parliament of religi uh, religions. So this is not about, because if, if people apprehend, they fear that this is, this will be used to create uniformity. Then I ask the question that the Hindu law is applicable not only to the Hindus, it is applicable to the Sikhs, to the Buddhists, to the Jain. Has that law been able to create uniformity among all these communities? Not even among Hindus. The systems, the rituals, the customs are different in Northern India. They are different in South India. The purpose is not to create kind, some kind of imposed uniformity, no. The purpose of the uniform civil code as it was envisaged by the honorable members of the Constituent Assembly was to create uniformity of justice, uniformity of rights and obligation which arise from certain facts like marriage. It is the uniformity of justice, not uniformity. And nobody is interested. Sometimes point is made that this is some hidden agenda, uh, particularly the name of the RSS is mentioned. Here I have with me an interview which was given by RSS chief. And mind you, I'm, I'm quoting it. I'm not, I do not totally agree with this interview. But of the question of uniformity, I'm referring to this interview. This interview he gave to organizer on 26 August 1972. And the question was asked by Mr. Malkani, who was later Rajya Sabha member, Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry. He asked this question. You don't think that a uniform civil code is necessary for promoting the feeling of nationalism? And I don't. This might surprise you or many others. I see. Guru Golwalkarji said that Europe is a new, is a young continent. Their civilization is new. Our civilization is time-tested civilization. We diversity. We cherish diversity. So this fear should be, they should get rid of this fear that the, uh, there is any design behind this constitutional proposal. Uniform civil court, any, uh, if, if, uh, if it really is going to create problems as far as the practice of religion is concerned, then my question is that the Muslims who live in Europe, Muslims who live in United States of America, even Muslims who live in a Muslim country like Turkey, have they become less Muslim? This, uni this Muslim personal law, which people try to preserve, this is not applicable, applicable even in India in all these states. Goa has a uniform civil code. Kashmir, this law is not applied. Are these people less Muslims? And secondly, because the question of religion is brought into this issue, therefore I would like to quote something from the religious scripture. Constitution of a country in Arbi is described as Misa, or covenant, some, some great understanding which has been reached. Now, now the question is that who are the members of the Constituent Assembly? I don't want to mention other names, but Maulana Abul Kalam Azad was also there. There were many other Muslims there. Now, and I am really surprised when I see anybody who has taken oath of the Constitution. And it is essential to take oath of the Constitution if you become a member of the, any elected body, even as a citizen. When you participate in certain activities, you have to take oath of the Constitution. 
So how anybody who has taken oath of the constitution can, if they argue that the time is not yet right, let us wait for some more time. I can understand. I may differ with that viewpoint. But when they outrightly oppose uniform civil court, I'm surprised that are they aware the oath which have they have taken to uphold the constitution of the country and they do it in the name of Islam. And Islam views very negatively those who break the promise which they have made. And the, one of the verses of the Quran says, Al-Lazina yan kuduna ahda lahi min baadi misaatihi wa yaktawuna ma amar Allahu bihi an yusala. And those who break the covenant after it is ratified. Constitution is Misa. And then further, again, because opposition is uniform civil court is opposed in the name of religion. Therefore, I'm relying on the scripture. Otherwise, there was no need for me. Further, it is said that You know, I have not found in any book, if anybody, any scholar or any person who claims as representative or is speaking on taking into consideration the religious susceptibility, if they can enlighten us, that is there anything written anywhere where which says that the criminal law of Islam is less important and personal law of Islam is more important. Mercantile law is less important. Only the family law, where, where the male, the man gets more rights. Otherwise, in the criminal law, there is no difference. So our preference is only for that part of the law, which gives privacy to men, which confers more rights on men. In fact, Quran condemns this mindset and say, says, Afatu minuna bibadil kitabi wa takfuruna bibad. Then it is only a part of the book that you believe in and do you reject it as? But what is the reward of those among you who behave like this? But disgrace is this life. And we are seeing it everywhere because this distinction between the criminal law, mercantile law, personal law, this in itself making any distinction between different branches of law itself is unacceptable. And then I would like to, I think I have taken enough time. Uh, I would like to conclude, I would like to ask this question, whether during the period of Sultanate, whether during the period of uh, when the Mughals were ruling, this the personal law which we have today, that was not there. The Muslims of India till 1937, except the performance of the customs and, and rituals, otherwise in matter of succession, in matter of adoption, they were following the customary laws of the communities to which they belong. It was only in 1937 when the British they were pursuing the policy which I referred to in the beginning to create the consciousness that we are different, which ultimately culminated in the, in the demand for partition of the country. Till 1937, Muslims belonging to different communities, Gujarati Muslims were following their own customary laws. People in Kerala were following their own customary laws it was again the handiwork of the British to create divisions in the society. Therefore, my, I hold the view that uniform civil court, as this is part of the directive principles of the uh, constitution, therefore it is our obligation, it is our duty to create conducive atmosphere in the country remove the misunderstandings, go to the people, educate them, tell them that this is not about creating social uniformity or uh, 
the civil uniformity this is about uniformity of justice this is about uniformity of obligations and duties which arise from certain facts like merit and i feel that uh, definitely time has come when we should uh, make uh, we should go forward and make take positive steps in the direction of fulfillment of this constitutional promise thank you very much jai hind thank you very much thank you honorable governor uh, shri arif mohammad khan ji and for your very very erudite and extremely well researched uh, 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 address uh, on this occasion and if i may say so your particular reference to what was said by lord hamilton who you put in an appropriate context your argument that it was perhaps a well thought out attempt by the british to create a legal defense some kind of a legal defense to keep our society divided these are words which will go a very long way you also alluded very strongly to the fact i totally agree with you that that the time has come to for us to take up the mantle which was left upon us by the constituent assembly of this country which removed aspects such as the separate electorate but left it to to the to the to the to the future rulers of this country to take the next step and that is why they left the reference in the in the uniform civil code in article 44 of the constitution the very fact that for over seven decades we have left it untouched is something we must debate on today shri arif mohammad khan also very importantly you would know that the time has come and everyone's thinking about it the supreme court is now thinking about whether and i and the the, the bench comprising uh, just uh, chief justice of india uu lalit and justice ravindra bhat just a few days back ask the center to make it stand clear within 3 weeks in fact on the feasibility of implementing such a court so your words this conversation on this occasion is going to go a long way in stirring up the much necessary conversation on the subject for your for your most most erudite words today we all are very grateful and i thank you all very much thank you very much and and uh, mr uh, shiarif mohammad khan